This is the Improv Chronicle podcast. I'm Lloydie. It's Tuesday, 21st April, 2020. In the second part of this series on online improv, we revisit some of the voices you heard last time. Improv practitioners who've taken their work onto visual online platforms like Zoom in order to still teach and perform. As the global improv community continues to wrestle with its current inability to do in-person public performances, we hear about the discoveries, the moments of joy, and the future of online improv. Will something that's become necessary end up leading our art form somewhere new? Back to Nick Oram, who you heard from last week, from London UK improv group Do Not Adjust Your Stage. They didn't simply just take one of their existing forms and put it online. We were doing, a, at the moment, we're doing a show called The Improvised Chat Show. And the reason we decided to do a new format is we wanted to think of something that felt like it made sense online and that worked well within the limitations of 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 being online basically so so that was our our thinking in terms of doing this show how can we do a show that sort of makes sense in terms of people being spread over different spaces and not all in the in the in the same space and so a chat show seemed to work well for that what we didn't want to sort of pretend that we were all actually in the same room and this wasn't like a conversation online we felt that it would almost look a little bit a bit false um so we wanted to try and find something that f- fitted within that limitation that we already had although i'm really admiring people that are sort of challenging these things a little bit more at the moment so what how much do you think you'll retain uh, online shows when god willing we're all back performing in theaters doing what we normally do i'd like to keep doing it i think it's i think it's really fun i think it's really enjoyable I think for us, this show is quite fun in terms of um, characterization, actually, in particular, in terms of um, making us take on specific characters and really delve into them in quite a deep way. So it's enjoyable in, in, in that way and useful as a skill there. And I think we're developing a good show. So I'd like to keep doing it. I don't think we'll do it quite as much. So I imagine once we can perform on stage again, then we'll want to do that a lot more. But it'd be cool if this was something that could last, I think. For Varun and Anand in Delhi, India, there's been an unexpected consequence of moving online. I think we found a wonderful tool that makes improv more accessible to uh, people who are differently abled. It's now even more visible that you can, as long as you have an internet connection and a way to log in, there are games you can play from the comfort of your home and not feel in any way excluded. I think that's a big deal. The second thing is we are seeing far more international collaborations now. We have an an American facilitator coming in for one of our sessions soon. uh, And then we have a Russian facilitator joining us. So the, the world of improv seems to be expanding and there you just, it just forces us to see what else is out there. And what's been really wonderful for me as a improv practitioner, I'm kind of protective of my practice, especially with the things I discover. I don't want people to just come in and then just play out the games and pretend that's a mental health exercise. But it's been amazing how open people are online to sharing what their techniques are, how you can facilitate online, what games you can play. And I'm finding out so many others. Uh, I mean, if you don't mind, there's a Lacey Alana from Yes and Brain. Uh, she does wonderful work, and we'll be collaborating with Elena Fishbane, who's also a great improv facilitator online. And I hadn't even considered these options when I had been doing my physical workshops. I'm hoping this is something that will continue far after uh, the quarantine is over and we go back to whatever we consider normal times. And the unexpected outcomes of this move online have taken many forms for many different practitioners. Elana Fishbein from the Magnet Theatre in New York, USA. I guess um, as far as unexpected outcomes, you talked about Varun. I mean, I I didn't know Varun uh, two weeks ago, and now I I feel like he's one of my my best best friends. <laughs> you know, like I think <laughs> I, I think I've like laid a lot on the relationship with someone who I've only done a few online workshops with, but um, I. 
my world has just grown so big. I never thought that I'd be collaborating with with someone across the planet and that we'd be negotiating time zones. That's insane. And it's so exciting that he is doing the same work that I'm doing with, with people in his community. I think sometimes, you know, when we, when we're in New York and we're working at our one theater, we get so petty and small. We're stuck thinking like, Oh, like I wasn't cast in this show or I'm not on this house team. And those are such petty things when the world is so much bigger and really you can do improv anywhere at any time of day if you're resourceful and creative. There's been an evolution in the work of Open Heart Theatre in Newcastle as a result of going online as well, as Owen Scrivens from the company explains. I think so many of us, um, depending on how we've learned, is we sort of chase that first funny thing in the scene. What's the first thing the audience laughs at? Or, or what is the audience laughing at? Let's do more of that, especially if we're doing comedy stuff. But even if we're doing theatrical stuff, sometimes what's the first thing the audience, audience gasp at? What, when does someone look uncomfortable? You can feel the emotion in the room. I think sometimes trusting that you don't have to chase that first thing anymore and just being like, no, let's just trust that what, what I'm doing will eventually get to a good point and let's just trust if we do good improvisation whether the audience is laughing crying gasping it doesn't matter immediately because there's there might be a payoff further down the road they might be enjoying it but not laughing i think that's something that comes with music especially is that sometimes it can be very tempting to put in a rhyme as a punchline in a song to get a laugh when there's an audience there without an audience there you're more tempted to just try to sort of sing a good song Um, which might not get a big laugh from an audience, a big round of applause, but just because, so you're not chasing that as much. And so I think sometimes you will be more patient. But it's not just the performers who've changed, according to Nick from Do Not Adjust Your Stage. One of the useful things in terms of doing improv online is that audiences are incredibly forgiving at the moment to people experimenting and trying things out online everyone knows that we've been forced into this this crazy situation and so if you try something out online i don't think you're gonna get people being like oh man that that's not very good or you know i didn't like that or whatever i think we've got an audience that's that's really forgiving and really wanting to see the best in in things at the moment because of this the situation that we're in so i suppose i would encourage anyone that's thinking oh, i'd like to try some online improv I'd encourage them to just try it out and and give it a go. And I've certainly heard improvisers saying, oh, I'm I'm not sure. I I feel really weird about it. Um, I I, I don't want it to be shit because it's up on the internet for everybody to see forever. Um, I I think a lot of people do feel quite a lot of trepidation um, about doing any kind of online show. Yes. And and I I get that. I think that I, 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 I can understand that mindset. And definitely I've had those those thoughts as well I think if you're going to try and do something online or you've been thinking about it before now is the time to do it just because we're in this context where people are very very forgiving so you can do something that actually isn't that good but might get good the more you do it and the more you try it and you develop it so um I think yes that that makes sense that sort of slight fear factor but I reckon if ever there was a time to try and go past that, then then try to do it now. Sophie Owen from Leeds University Improv Group in the UK has been thinking more about the attitude we bring to improv and how moving online has shifted that. It feels like there's been more of a trend towards um, mindfulness, um, kind of warm-ups, because I'm used to getting into an improv room and maybe we'll do like a little like kind of calming down warm up and then we'll kind of get into the kind of high energy stuff like like the whiz bang the i'm a mountain whatever games kind of stuff and then i've noticed that like i don't know if it's because of the particular practitioners that i've been attending workshops at but i feel like there's been more of a trend towards like mindfulness stuff because because we're we're doing improv in this space that is and we're, we're not with other people we need to give people a better sense of their own body and other people's bodies and i think that doing stuff like mindfulness techniques at the start of a workshop which i feel like i that was 
I don't really remember that being a thing when I've done workshops in the past, but I, I'm interested to see it emerging. And I'm, and I'm hoping that maybe that will question the way that we do warm ups when we're out of this situation. And how people feel about the online experience has been something that Varun has been observing as well. It's really seeing how uh, much fun people are having. The, the, the main thing we hear is, I really needed that. What people come to and say is, I really needed that. We were coming from a place of not abandoning uh, our most vulnerable patrons. But it, it's now become an area that we want to expand upon and make part of our regular practice because it really is fun. And there's so much less of a uh, difficulty in coming in. The most surprising thing has been how these games have been able to be translated. But with all this love of our new world, there's still real emotional attachment to everything that came before and that we hope we'll see again before too long as well. Ilana Fishbein. Like I love, I love my, my family at the Magnet Theatre and you know that those last few days leading up to when we were closing, I, at one point I was walking down the street and I, I was like, this might be the last time I really take this kind of walk in, in Brooklyn in a while. And I'm just so thankful for my colleagues. And, you know, I am so grateful for all of those hours spent just sitting in the training center office before class, just shooting the shit. I, I love them so much. And, I, I I couldn't ask for a better team of, of of people to have spent my career with up until this wow. point. I mean, it is a really top to bottom. Everyone at the Magnet is wonderful. While making these recent episodes, I've been forced to think a lot about where we're at with improv. I admire so much everyone who's spoken to me about the online work that they're doing. Whilst I've elected not to teach, I've still been doing occasional online shows in Vision on Zoom. I've had fun. They've been very silly in the best possible way, but I would be lying if I said they were the same buzz or I thought they were the same quality as what I usually do. For me, most of this feels like a weird limbo. And then something happened in a wonderful moment. And I'll come to that wonderful moment in just a second, but just a few days ago, I heard something that made so much sense to me on another podcast. You may know the backline with Rob Norman and Adam Corley. Uh, Rob's been on this podcast before. And when they returned for a new season of the backline, they discussed this very issue of doing shows on Zoom. And they've kindly given me permission to include a clip of that discussion here. It's relevant partly because it sums up so much of how I feel about Zoom shows, but also because it'll lead nicely into telling you about that wonderful moment that occurred in my life just the other day. Uh, but the future of improv. <laughs> this is very interesting. I did see some, again, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but some, the idea floating around of, you know, improvisers are used to performing in basements, in back rooms of bars. We've performed on shows where rats have run across the stage. Um, finding like adapting to shitty, not ideal venues is what improvisers do. Mm -hmm. And so the internet is no different. Um, I think whatever happens here will probably be temporary. I think there might be some residual online hangouts for, you know, especially bringing together international groups, but as far as I can see so far and what I've tried to get involved with myself, um, it just doesn't seem ideal. I, I haven't, have you seen any shows that you, or been a part of any shows that you felt like, Ooh, this is a new angle on this that might, um, that might take off even if this pandemic thing wasn't happening. Well, I think a big part of improv is about connection. You know, um, in my other life, I do podcasting for public radio, and I do storytelling, which are like live storytelling events. And all three of these things share something in common. They are all incredibly lo-fi. They are not the um, surround sound 3D Marvel movie that we are used to. Like, we are used to having a computer screen open and a phone and an iPad, and we're watching something else. Like, just overwhelming our senses and i think these even something like podcast strangely enough creates community storytelling creates community improv creates community and i think that's the thing that we're so desperate for 
when we move this on to Zoom, I think right now it is a relief. I think it is a substitute for that feeling because it can feel very lonely. But I think what we desperately crave is the in-person connection. And so I don't know if this is going to translate into a permanent thing that will replace live performance. For me, that says so much. Storytelling, improv, podcasts, they have a huge amount of overlap. Maybe I would say that. I've worked in audio for most of my life, but for me at least, theatre of the mind is more easily achieved on an improv stage and on a podcast than it is on the platform of Zoom. That's not to say Zoom doesn't have a place. You've just heard almost two whole episodes of this podcast that clearly show Zoom has already made itself a space in improv. But it's not the only space. A few years ago, I used to be a regular cast member of Destination, The Improvised Journey. It's a 15-minute improvised podcast giving an insight into one person's car journey to a specific destination. Welcome to Destination, The Improvised Journey. A couple of weeks ago, Katie Shute and Tony Harris, who made Destination, decided to bring it back and they asked if I'd be part of the cast for some episodes. My media reaction was, this is the perfect time for something like this. I was delighted. And then when it came to recording, well, that that was a joy. I can safely say it is by far the most fun I've had while in isolation. For me, online improv doesn't have to mean Zoom. And that opens up another strand of possibility. Next time on the Improv Chronicle podcast. What sort of theatre can we create in podcasts, given a podcast isn't usually live? While improvisers who use Zoom have the live element, what can improvised podcasts add to the online improv offering? The Improv Chronicle podcast is produced and presented by me, Lloydie James Lloyd. Please subscribe and rate us on your favourite podcast app. It makes the hugest amount of difference, believe me. You can rate this podcast by going to ratethispodcast.com slash improvchronicle. And if you've an idea for a future episode, get to improvchronicle.com.